Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. This is the third of the Hamilton Education um, webinar series. Today, we're talking about the future of testing in admissions, and in particular, the UCs. Um, I thought we would start with another poll. It was interesting last time to see what kinds of responses we had. Um, um, I'm going to ask people to take a look at this admissions profile. This is the last year, fall 2018, that the UCs made this level of granular data available. Uh, the trend, I'm sad to say, has been to be more opaque, to have less transparency. It's now impossible to see bands of GPAs and the acceptance rates for them. So I want everyone to just take a look, if you don't mind, if you're above a 4.0 GPA, that means you took APs, you took probably a lot of them, you got almost always A's in them. Uh, that's what above a 4.0 is. When I was in high school in Fort Wayne, Indiana in the 1980s, no one had above a 4.0 because there were no AP classes. Uh, if you have a 3.7 or 3.89 uh, when you applied in 2017 to be a member of the 2018 freshman class at UCLA, you can see if you had a 3.8 or a 3.9, when I was in high school, if you had a 3.9, you were a stone cold nerd. I mean, you were, that was a very good GPA. I don't know, I didn't know anyone on the soccer team who had a 3.9. Uh, you're 3.7% likely to get into UCLA. And let's look at the ACT composite range. If you're a 35, a 33, a 36, you're about 30% likely to get into UCLA if you applied in 2017. You can see that there were 113,000 applicants and 53,000 of them had um, effectively perfect grades. This is gonna be framing in some way the discussion I wanna have today. And I think Maella is gonna start a poll um, that everyone, um, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like everyone to participate in. So it asks you, an applicant this year, this is actually not hypothetical, had a 4.75 GPA and a 36 on the ACT. He is smiley, happy, involved in many extracurricular activities. He also has two patents. He's applying for computer science. What are his chances of getting into UCLA? Um, well, I'm liking the, um, okay, very interesting. All right, I'm gonna let everyone have a minute to, um, Okay, the majority so far are siding with 75% um, and the next biggest group is saying maybe about a 50% chance. Um, all right. Um, Maybe we'll, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna take a picture of this just so I don't lose it. Um, okay, it looks like most people think 75%, um, a slightly smaller group think 50%, a few um, pessimists say 10%, a few optimists say 100%. All right, Myla, can you remove that poll? We need to get rid of that. All right. Um, there's an answer to this question, um, maybe two answers. Um, statistically, everyone saw that the numbers that align with percentages of acceptance for someone with those scores and grades, extraordinary scores and grades, uh, the numbers were about 25 to 30%. Um, so I was kind of expecting people to say, oh, well, then 
Mr. Hamilton showed the numbers, this student would be 25 to 30 percent likely to get into UCLA. That's what the numbers show. Um, in fact, um, uh, most people thought maybe 50 percent or 75 percent, maybe because he's so spectacular. Uh, in fact, in my experience, um, if you are spectacular and amazing, you can perhaps get a bit above those numbers. Uh, in fact, more than 80% of our students last year and this year were accepted to Berkeley, who we worked with for college counseling. Um, so we're way above the average. But in fact, for a computer science major, the average is gonna be for someone with those numbers about 10%. That would be the right answer. In fact, the student that we uh, borrowed the data from, that student, um, uh, did not get in to UCLA. He did get in uh, to Harvard and Yale, so don't cry for him. He got into Berkeley, electrical engineering, computer science, but he did not get into UCLA. Um, there's a mathematical concept, not that I should be lecturing anyone on math, called the gambler's fallacy, and basically means if we know a coin toss is a 50-50 um, proposal, and we see four heads in a row, and we ask, on the next toss, what's the likelihood of heads or tails? The answer is, of course, 50%. It's not influenced by the previous outcomes. Um, this student got into Harvard and Yale. UCLA didn't know he got into Harvard and Yale when they made their decision. Um, point I want to make is that the UCs currently practice holistic admissions. It's an admissions process where they look at many factors, um, partly because we know that that's how human beings should probably be judged, looking at many factors. Um, it also is an admissions policy based on uh, the fact that 53,000 kids, if we look at just a number, uh, look like they're abundantly good, and yet UCLA will have a freshman class of no more than 6,200. Um, holistic admission is also based on the UC's reaction to Prop 209, which was a voter proposition um, passed in 1996 that asked the California voters to contemplate should affirmative action, should race-based and gender-based admissions be a part of UC and Cal State admissions or should it be ended? And the voters resoundingly decided it should be ended. I'm starting here because um, I was trying to find a good picture. Um, I had a little trouble this morning. In 1996, I was a graduate student at UCLA and I went door to door uh, along with other graduate students um, explaining to Los Angeles residents why it would be a mistake to end affirmative action. I helped organize civil disobedience uh, in the streets uh, surrounding UCLA. We drew straws to see who would be arrested in a very well organized uh, nonviolent protest. Um, the Results, of course, were that Prop 209 was made law, and I was worried at what the effect would be uh, on UC campuses. I was worried that students I had taught who were underrepresented minorities, I would see fewer of them in the future. Um, I'm happy to tell you that it had a happy ending, at least for the last 20 years. The UCs built holistic admissions, which is an admissions process looking at many factors. So you can see, you do not even have a likelihood of getting in because you are perfect in scores and grades. Um, there have been a lot of people in the last six months that have learned the UCs actually don't admit primarily by numbers and scores and they haven't for more than 20 years. Um, holistic admission uh, has been a pretty elegant solution to the problem of how do we fairly admit. And I'm talking today uh, with everyone because the trend is to move away from holistic admission and instead to look at um, uh, numbers uh, like GPA instead of a broad set of data and to uh, maybe look at factors that might even be um, contravening the, the decision in Prop 209. Um, the holistic admission response to UC changes in admission in 1996 were really the most profound but they also had a policy called ELC or eligibility in the local context. It basically means um, if you had grades in the top 4% of your high school, no matter what your scores, 
you were guaranteed to get a spot in AUC. Now you need to know that guarantee didn't mean if you apply only to Berkeley, uh, you're guaranteed to get into Berkeley. It really meant before Merced was introduced, you were guaranteed to get into Riverside. And then when Merced was constructed and operating, um, you were guaranteed to get into Merced. So it was not exactly what people imagined. And that program of ELC has been diluted. It's been watered down because uh, too many people want to go to the UCs. It's too popular. Now, if you're in the top 9% of your high school, you have a guarantee not that you'll be admitted to a UC. You have a guarantee that they will consider you for admission. And when they consider you for admission, they're considering you for Merced. Um, I want to make sure people know ELC meant uh, different schools that have fewer resources, may have kids with good grades but low scores. Let's make sure there's a space for them in the UCs. In my experience, with holistic admission, it means if you have low scores but an extraordinary story of resilience or accomplishment, if you have good grades, even if your school didn't prepare you, perhaps as well as kids who are middle class in better funded school districts, there still may be a place for you in the UCs. Um, in fact, there may be a place for you in a lot of very selective universities. Um, I want to contrast the UC's decision to invoke holistic admission, where they look at many factors, with the Ivy League admissions, as it's been for almost the last 20 years. The Ivies, I say this from extensive experience, they fill up more than half of the freshman cohort with students who are going to fit into certain categories. They're going to be legacies, they're going to be donors, they're going to be athletes, they're going to be diversity recruits, or resoundingly, um, a resoundingly large number of feeder schools, of kids who come from boarding schools. In my ex experience, um, when the Ivies talk about diversity, they really mean um, students who are going to fit a category of ethnicity or race or gender that is useful to their numbers, but students who are not likely to struggle in an Ivy League environment. They've learned when they take kids who are in fact, disadvantaged or marginalized, um, it can be difficult to transition to the Ivy League. They often don't have the support in any number of ways. And so the Ivies, I would describe it with the word cynical. The Ivies have built a policy of accepting kids who are often, um, in San Diego, kids who come from Rancho Santa Fe and um, who speak English as their only language, but they are able to kind of nominally fit um, a category that's helpful for them. Um, they want people who will pay full tuition and will come to Ivy Leagues. I'm going to leave it to others to argue about the ethics or the merits of admitting um, a student. This is a real story, a student whose grandparents on one side were from Spain. Um, Technically, that person um, is, in a way, Spanish. The more I asked the student about the circumstances so that we could kind of flesh them out and make it clear to Ivy League schools, uh, it became awkward because one parent said, um, the grandparents in Spain were supporters of the Franco regime. Um, that means they were not metaphorically or Facebook fascists, but literal, literal fascists. Um, but there's a spot for that person in the Ivy League. Um, for years, I've um, myself been a critic of the SAT and ACT, and so it's a little strange that I'm kind of defending it now, but um, I've been legitimately unhappy with the changes to the SAT uh, because they remove vocabulary, which I thought was a very um, good measure of uh, someone's reading. It's true, you could learn vocabulary cards, I have some here. Some of you with older brothers and sisters may recognize these. Um, but you also could learn those through reading. In fact, I found a spot in a college, a top tier liberal arts college almost entirely because I read a lot and the SAT showed something that my grades didn't show. I was a teenage boy. Um, if uh, Fortnite had been invented, I probably would have been playing Fortnite and not studying. But I did read and the SAT helped me. Um, the critics, in my opinion, though, 
of the SAT in the last 10, 15 years have made what I can only call bad arguments about the SAT. Um, for instance, uh, a very famous person named Robert Schaefer, who has an organization called Fair Test, he's argued that um, the SAT is unfair because it's coachable. Um, in various conferences around the country over the last decade and a half, I've asked Bob, um, what kind of test can you envision that would measure someone's skills or preparedness for college and is in fact not coachable? Um, I would say math and science and reading and grammar are coachable. If they're not, um, I wonder what math and science and English teachers are doing all day. Um, the idea that middle class kids can afford coaching and it's thus unfair is something to think about. It's an argument against the SATs that is a little more weighty. But two famous studies conducted on the SAT ACT, one of them by NACAC, the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, found that um, most test prep is pretty ineffective. It's an awkward thing for me to be sharing with all of you, but most test prep is not skills based. It is um, directed at middle class families to make sure their kids are familiar with the test, but it's full of tricks and shortcuts. And so the average improvement is 20 to 30 points. 20 to 30 points is not a game changer. It's not an advantage that middle class kids have um, uh, test prep. If most people are doing prep that gains them 20 or 30 points. Um, and uh, it's fair to say that the local school district you're in, the quality of the teaching, the quality of the instruction, even the educational level of your household, that has a much stronger impact than the typical prep environment that a middle class kid would enjoy. Uh, many people who are critics of the SAT feel that practicing or coaching it is essentially a form of cheating. Um, I've heard Bob Schaefer basically say that. I find myself wondering if practicing and trying at something uh, is cheating, then the Olympics have to be rethought. I mean, for someone like Bob Schaefer, the Olympics should be an event where we pull people off the street, don't give them any swimming lessons, we throw them in the pool and we see um, who can make it uh, across an Olympic sized pool the fastest. Some will probably drown. Um, we don't generally live our lives in this way. It's odd that we have a cultural moment these days where we're entertaining college admissions in terms of um, thinking it's unfair that some people have studied more or have put in more work. I would say it's unfair, in my opinion, without a doubt, that some people have more access to education and those resources. And I'm, I have been for decades committed to trying to ameliorate those kinds of inequities. But um, some of the critiques of the SAT and critiques um, of other kinds of metrics for admissions seem a little puzzling to me. Um, we're not really trying to find out in the Olympics who's the most innately talented, but a combination of things. Maybe there's VO2 max and lung size and muscle mass, but also practice and time in the water. Um, most teachable things are coachable things. Um, we have a word that describes these teachable, coachable things, and the word we use is uh, school. Um, that's the essence of it. The Regents arguments for the UCs are basically that the SAT um, is essentially racist because it does reflect different groups having different averages on the SAT. The UCs have proposed um, to put on hold the requirement of the SAT and ACT. They're still going to be used for the next three or four years. Uh, they've said they want to phase them out entirely and they want to focus entirely uh, on grades uh, and perhaps um, college essays to learn a little bit more about the student. The regents in a 23 to zero uh, vote um, last month, uh, which is a curious number, 23 to zero either means um, it's such an obvious thing that there could be no disagreement or it means a kind of ideological lockstep is happening. The regents also said that the Varsity Blues scandal that dominated the news 
uh, last year was a part of their decision. They said that that demonstrated that the SAT and ACT are in fact unfair. Um, they've said they're going to make the tests optional and they're going to try to create their own test. One, we presume that will not show any differences between uh, different school districts or different access to education. Uh, or they said they'll have no, no test at all and it will be um, only grades that will be the numbers and data points. It's curious though, people should know, um, the UC faculty commissioned a report. It's 220 pages. I have it in front of me. I've read most of it. Um, the year-long study that produced this 220-page report uh, refuted the arguments that the UC regents made convincingly. Uh, the chairs of the study uh, were one African-American scholar and one Latino scholar, and their report said that the SAT and ACT in admissions for the UCs actually helps underrepresented minority students. It finds students who've overcome circumstances. Uh, the faculty reported pragmatic concerns, uh, practical concerns about how you build a class without knowing something other than grades when so many have the same uh, perfect or nearly perfect grades. Um, in other words, how will admissions decisions be made? Um, um, the UCs are still going to need to make very, very difficult decisions. Um, on a personal and professional note, I'm a little troubled that their proposal is to have less data in making these decisions, to want less information about students rather than more. I've had many friends who are UC admissions readers. Um, they spend about six minutes reading your application. Um, uh, the idea that they can somehow peer uh, into you in a three-dimensional way in that kind of context, um, I find it unconvincing. Um, test scores um, are still going to be used in the UCs for the next several years, and they are going to be used in selective admission uh, for the foreseeable future simply because we can't know the quality or meaning of your grades alone without some other metrics that give us some independent confirmation of it. And we want, in general, to see a three-dimensional variety of um, data points about a human being. Um, um, the test optional trend is something that um, I have some opinions about. Um, test optional um, is, uh, depends on how you look at it. Test optional for University of Chicago almost certainly meant that they want more applicants that might be scared off by submitting an SAT or ACT. Again, I'll leave it to others to debate whether this is a noble thing or not, but the vast majority, more than 90% of students who got into U, U, U Chicago submitted SATs and ACTs. So for most, most kids, you're gonna, you're gonna need them. Um, Myela, maybe we'll show a slide that represents a message from MIT. This is on MIT's website. MIT recently uh, meditated making subject tests optional and then decided actually they're going to um, just get rid of them. Now you should know subject tests have been over many studies proven to be the most direct, uh, the most um, convincing measure of a single subject. I mean, this is not counterintuitive. Subject tests um, have the strongest predictive value of success when we see what students are intending um, to, to study. Um, my, I'm getting a message that says people aren't seeing slides. Hopefully people will see those slides. Um, if you can't see the slide, I'm gonna read it. I, I can see it. It's a MIT um, um, message and it says, I took the subject test. Can I submit my scores for your consideration? Um, MIT is refreshingly honest, even if 
in some other ways baffling. MIT says, no, uh, you can't submit scores because in fairness to all applicants, we won't consider them for anyone. We think it would be unfair to consider scores only from those who've scored well and therefore choose to send them to us. They're neither recommended nor optional. They're simply not a part of our process anymore. Um, I admire the honesty because they are saying, of course, um, these are, uh, if we make them optional, it'll benefit the people who send them in. And so I want you to consider that for a moment. When you see that scores are optional, MIT is saying, well, of course they would benefit people who, who send them in. Um, I sometimes tell kids, an engagement ring is not a matter of law. You can ask someone to marry you without a ring. It's optional, but um, you know, go ahead, try it, see how that works. Um, what's fascinating to me though, is that MIT has decided that they're going to eliminate the subject test, the strongest predictors of success in certain areas, um, uh, when they acknowledge that it would be unfair to people who do better uh, and have stronger scores. We're in a curious cultural moment when MIT is um, saying, because it would be unfair to kids who are better at these subjects, we're going to not consider them. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, this is MIT. Um, Myla, thanks, I think we can get rid of that slide. Um, I'm interested in the fact that data and uh, lots of robust data points being data-driven is a trend uh, that we see in almost everything except college admissions. Um, some of you may know this book by Michael Lewis or the movie that starred Brad Pitt. The book's, of course, Moneyball. The idea is that um, some very clever people notice that um, if you judge baseball players uh, by their looks, if you judge them superficially, how tall are they? Even are they good looking? Um, you're going to miss some people who are making contributions, who have talents that are otherwise hidden. Uh, and of course, the Oakland Athletics, they're um, uh, last 10, 12 years of success has a lot to do with looking at numbers uh, that can tell us more than our subjective, superficial understanding of things. Um, we're seeing hidden talent in baseball players who might be shorter than we imagine a baseball player should be or um, a little bit overweight. They're still making contributions and the numbers show things that could be otherwise hidden. Um, Social psychology in the last 20 or 30 years tells us that all of us are riddled with unconscious biases and prejudices, and the numbers often let us see, um, ironically, something truer and something um, that might be missing in our subjective impression. Um, in my opinion, the hubris of admissions policies that imagine that by looking at a couple 350 word essays in six minutes, they can measure your heart, mind, and soul, your potential to succeed. Um, it bothers me. I want you to consider that student who got into Harvard and Yale and Berkeley and was rejected by UCLA. I tend to think the word that describes that, some might say unfair. I'm probably not troubled that he didn't get into UCLA. I would say arbitrary. These decisions are already massively arbitrary they are probably going to become more arbitrary. Certainly as more people apply to the UCs because the restrictions or I should say the requirements have been eased, it'll mean more people applying, but no more spots available. The arbitrariness will probably increase. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Mr. Pilliser and I met with, interviewed a person who was uh, admissions for Duke and I asked her um, to tell me about the application essays to Duke that she read that made the strongest impression. Um, I didn't end up hiring her because she could come up with one and it was one where a student's mom dies in the essay. She said it was heartbreaking, really powerful. John and I had lunch afterwards and talked about whether your parents dying should be the primary um, reason to admit someone into Duke. We kind of felt um, overcoming challenges and difficulties would be um, a very strong signal that someone would succeed in college, but it 
troubled me that that was the only example of an essay that she could come up with. Um, there are some students who have infamously killed off their parents in Ivy League essays, and a year or two later, um, an um, administrator in an Ivy League school calls the home and finds out that uh, the person's mom is living uh, and not dead. That can be awkward. The problem with using narrative, and believe me, I'm a fan of narrative. I taught 18th and 19th century British literature at UCLA. I uh, taught narrative theory. I think we're good in my offices at helping students build narratives. The problem with narrative is um, they're evaluated subjectively uh, by readers who have different impressions. And um, narratives, when it comes to college, um, are not only probably more, they're not only not more reliable, they might be more problematic. Um, Myela, can you share this slide? What you should see is um, a picture of the cover of a book, A Million Little Pieces. And this is the author, James Fry. Oprah turned this guy into someone who was famous uh, and a millionaire. And um, all was well until his memoir, his true life recalling of his life on the street and his life as a drug addict. His friends who read the book said, this is great, except for one thing very little of it is true. He's exaggerated or simply fabricated the bulk of this story. Um, Oprah was not happy, but he didn't have to return the millions of dollars he made selling the book. In fact, he's written other books. But um, you, you, we should ask ourselves, um, if we want students to be admitted to college um, purely by GPA, and their memoirs. Um, memoirs are a tricky genre to work with. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. This is actually uh, from an ACT. Um, and there's a passage that I'm not gonna force you to read, but the passage is um, about memoirs. And I wanna draw your attention to um, the fact that the authors say, um, based on the passages, it can most reasonably be inferred that Gornick and Hemingway would agree when it comes to a writer's responsibility to be truthful in a memoir. Uh, here's answer choice A, the degree of truthfulness should be the same as that for fiction. That's not the right answer, according to the passages where authors discuss memoir. Uh, B, um, if a writer can't remember the exact details of a certain event, the event should be left out of the memoir. That's not the right answer. Uh, D, the writer should only include incidents that have documented evidence to support them. That's not the right answer. The right answer is, in a memoir, it's more important to create an artistic whole than relate only facts. Um, question 30. Another author wrote the following about the role of truth in memoir. A memoir is a story, not a history, and real life doesn't play out as a story. Um, the answer here is basically saying, the authors are going to take liberties with the facts of the memoir because, um, because uh, you need to sell the damn book. You need to make things more interesting, um, which is, I'm sure for a publishing company, um, something they can worry about. As taxpayers in California, we should be a little worried about whether we want memoirs to play the role that they are um, probably faded to play in the next couple of years. I'm gonna draw a couple of conclusions from what I've seen and read in the last couple of months regarding um, SAT, ACT, and the UC admissions changes. Um, the regents, but of course not the faculty, believe that the tests are unfair. Um, some even said the tests are racist, but the UC faculty um, came to a very different conclusion in a very racially diverse group of people who did a year long study um, I'm going to try to stay out of that debate. It sounds um, dangerous. I will share this opinion with you. Um, these tests almost certainly reveal inequalities in access to education. They're almost certainly the product in some sense of systemic racism, um, whether it's redlining of neighborhoods in decades past or even the residual effects 
of colonialism or slavery. The world is not fair and equitable. Um, the question would be, how do we make it more so? And the question is, in this instance, should we fix these problems by changing the way we fund education? Um, should we make it more equitable? Or should we simply get rid of the metrics that reveal these inequalities? That seems to be the path, the easy path that the UCs have taken. Um, the Varsity Blues scandal, many have pointed out, does not prove that if you're very rich, um, the SAT will reflect that. It almost certainly proves, even if you're very rich, very wealthy, and very privileged, if your kids are lazy and uninterested intellectually, uh, they won't do well on the SAT or ACT. And to get a good score, uh, you'll have to cheat. Uh, that's why they had to cheat, because being wealthy itself was not an inherent advantage. Um, one concern, of course, about the UC's decision is how will they make admissions decisions given the problematic nature of personal essays, the difficulty sorting through them, their permeability in terms of fact and fiction, and the fact that grades, uh, good grades, are so uh, common as to be almost meaningless in applying uh, and good grades tend to be um, easier or harder, depending on what school you're attending. The grades reflect a stronger or weaker school system. If they're making decisions using only grades, again, there's 53,000 people with fantastic grades applying to UCLA with GPAs well above a 4.0 to make a class of 6,000, maybe 6,200. Um, tutoring and more APs. Wealthier kids have more access to tutoring and will be in school districts that offer more APs and thus a stronger GPA number. Um, if they use personal narrative more heavily, uh, I promise you wealthier kids are going to have more help. Um, most teenage uh, essay writers need a little help. Um, that help is easy to find if you're middle class. Um, it's harder to find if you're not. And if they use race and ethnicity as factors, which is more or less what's at stake here, because um, it's the avowed goal of the UC regents to introduce that, then we may see a legal showdown in the courts because Prop 209 um, expressing the will of California voters um, expressly forbids admissions policies based on race, gender, ethnicity. Whether we should use race, gender, or ethnicity is an issue I won't get into. I'll leave it to other people. But currently, it's a matter of law that the UCs are not supposed to. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting. Focusing exclusively on grades, in my opinion, will simply create the same anxieties and fixations that we have in other countries. In other countries, we see the suicide rates spike uh, surrounding national exams because that is the number. Instead of many factors, holistic admission, there's one factor. Um, currently, the UCs are only talking about one uh, factor, uh, grades. I see that as potentially a problem. Uh, I've known too many kids whose grades are affected by social upheavals, by family drama, by illness. Um, that's why it's nice to have other metrics and other numbers. I've noticed that coaching of grades, just like coaching SAT and ACT, is definitely possible. Uh, we call it tutoring, and rich kids get more of it. APs um, are not available equally across all schools in California. I think the vast majority of selective colleges, for some of the reasons I've shared with you, they are going to retain tests because the alternatives haven't really been uh, presented very clearly. I think the trend to go optional will continue, but optional is a kind of winking um, arrangement where what they really mean is we want more diversity, which is almost unequivocally a good thing. But they also mean if you're middle class, if you go to a good school, um, we want test scores that reflect that fact. Um, here's a tip, something I've been thinking about lately. Because the national merit 
uh, cutoff for national merit semifinalist is driven by state. It's the top half percent in a state. And if fewer students, because of the really kind of sloppy messaging of newspapers saying they're dropping the SAT and ACT, they're actually making them optional, again, optional, uh, there will probably be fewer kids taking these tests in the next couple of years. And that means there'll be fewer kids studying, which means that the PSAT, which is linked for middle class families to scholarships, to merit driven scholarships, the PSAT cutoff will probably drop. And so it might get easier in some way to have a strong score, a score that could offer um, scholarships to people regardless of income or school or neighborhood. Um, uh, test scores are always going to be important to universities because applicants across the country and across the world have different um, meanings behind their grades. In fact, the UCs still plan to require out-of-state students and international students to submit scores. Um, if you um, want to attend um, if you're middle class and you don't fit into the groups the UCs want to see more of, uh, if you're in a group they want to see less of, then you should take these tests. If you want to attend a highly selective out of uh, state college, uh, which will um, maybe be more important as the UCs have more applicants in the coming years, you definitely need to take these tests. And if you want, to be eligible for merit awards, you'll probably still want to take these tests. Um, in my 20 years of experience, I would say we should never forget that there's no number and no narrative driven process that can ever really fairly equitably know what your future will be or who's most deserving of a spot. You should keep in mind that um, Many years ago, Warren Buffett applied to Harvard Business School. He was actually rejected. Um, Jeffrey Skilling was accepted. Warren Buffett, of course, is the wizard of Omaha, and Jeffrey Skilling was at the helm of Enron. He served um, in prison. He was incarcerated for many years. Um, scores um, will continue to matter for most of my students, for most of my clients, and they absolutely will if you're applying to any schools outside of the UC, UC system and within the UC system for the next several years. And we may find that the regents have to revisit this decision because it may in fact contradict uh, California state law. Um, I would say this though, you're not where you get in. You are always more than that. And you're always going to be more than a score, even for the most selective universities. Um, you are, in some sense, your story, but there's no story, no single story that can fully capture who you are. So um, it's why we have kids apply to a variety of colleges and why uh, in the United States, with 4,000 colleges and universities, um, there are many, many, many paths to building a future where almost anything is possible. I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that we had uh, that are sent to us previously. Um, to conclude, uh, does the UC require the SAT essay? Up until the last month or two, the answer was yes. Recently, the regents decided no. Um, it's a little puzzling to me because um, this is the only measure they have in a timed um, refereed setting of what your writing is like without coaches, without help. You can't get help. The SAT essay is meant to show that. It's strange that the trend has been for more students to make it not necessary or not consider it, but just have to tell you, the UC have decided they don't absolutely need it. Um, someone asks, are colleges going to come up with specific selection tests instead of the SAT? Um, you know, they used to. The Ivy Leagues used to have their own admissions tests, just as um, Oxford and Cambridge do. The problem is those tests have advantages that are much more profound to people who have prep and training. It will be more burdensome on students with fewer resources if there are multiple tests to study for. And the larger question, how you come up with a test 
that measures readiness for college, but doesn't reflect that different students have different access to what makes you ready, which we call school. I don't know how they're gonna do that. I would predict the UCs are gonna have a little trouble coming up with their own test. I think they're, again, kind of winkingly saying, we just wanna get rid of it. You could argue that the UC regents don't really care as long as they get um, a larger proportion of the students in categories that, that they want. Um, our SAT subject test is still an important part of the admissions process. Um, for engineering and computer science students, they absolutely are, especially the math two subject test. Most engineering admissions involve engineering faculty on a committee. They really want to see some objective measure of your math abilities and scores. And for many, many science schools, they're still going to be interested in subject tests. Although the trend is to again, make them either optional or in the case of MIT, just not required or considered. But again, MIT will never have an admissions process where there are no numbers. And if they do, I would say there'll be a kind of alumni um, rebellion going on. Um, can you talk about the latest SAT, ACT exams and possible exam dates? Um, it's difficult because we don't know what the future holds regarding COVID-19. I can tell you the August test dates look like they are planned, they're going to happen. Students should be six feet apart from one another when they're taking exams anyway. Um, it looks like seniors are gonna be prioritized for August and then after that date, other students who are 10th or 11th graders are probably gonna have more access, um, which is good because October is probably a good time for many students who are 10th going into 11th to take in the October of 11th that test. Um, here's a marvelous question, I love this one. Do private colleges such as Stanford look at anything besides GPA? Um, I'm a little puzzled that anyone would still ask that question, but there are 36,000 uh, high schools in the United States and there are 36,000 valedictorians. So if Stanford only looked at GPA and they said, we're only going to accept the number one kid in terms of GPA from every high school, they would be missing, okay, who's a leader, who's got a spark, but they'd still have 36,000 kids uh, and they have 1,650 spots. So the answer to um, well, colleges such as Stanford look at anything besides GPA is, um, hell yes, absolutely. Um, does it look like the PSAT will be given this year? Um, yeah, unless schools are shut down in October. Um, that remains to be seen. What's the best time to prepare for and take the ACT, SAT test? My opinion and my experience, after you've mastered all the subjects that are on the test, for most of my students, that would mean after IM3 math, after Algebra 2 or Algebra 3, 4, they're interchangeable. Uh, after that, that usually means the summer between 10th and 11th, and that means taking them in the fall of 11th. That would change if your math is on a slower track, and it might be sped up a little if your math is on a much faster track. What's a good score um, for the SAT, a minimum score? Dangerous thing to talk about, but I will say, for middle class kids who don't fit into any helpful categories, their parents are not legacies, they're not donors, 1500 on the SAT is pretty good. Um, and uh, 33 or higher on the ACT. And finally, if the ACT and SAT are optional, what will be valued more? Um, everything else, everything else. Um, your story will probably I mean, it's safe to say now your story is almost always more important than your score because a lot of people will have the same score. You need to make sure you don't have the same story. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I appreciate you sharing your time and uh, I'll try to answer further questions later if, um, if we can. Thank you. <laughs>